title of the message this afternoon is Soul Winning Versus Context, okay? And so I'm kind of, I think this is just going to be a little series. We're going to go through uh, just different, just probably not in any special order, but uh, various uh, verses that we would use out soul winning. And, uh, and then we're going to put them in the context and read the whole chapter and, all, you know, discuss exactly what's going on. And the reason why is because a lot of times we have, ver- we, we just kind of quote verses, uh, not just when we're soul winning, but just in general, verses that we've learned from the Bible that we memorize and we'll just quote them. And oftentimes we don't think about the context. And really the context, the context is important when you're quoting anybody. You, would you agree with me? Well, I, uh, I, I tend to, whatever preoccupies my mind during the week that didn't have to do with, with ministry, often ends up in, in a uh, message in, in, in some way or another. So I managed to work the Rittenhouse trial into, <laughs> into the message. <clears throat> Not into the message, but just this one illustration. All right, listening to, uh, I think it was, I think it was yesterday. Yeah, yeah, it was yesterday. Maybe it was the day before, I can't remember. Did they have a meeting yesterday? Okay, it was the day before. So the day before they had, uh, uh, they, they got together, the jury wasn't in there, and they were kind of hashing out uh, what it was is the prosecutor was coming up with some lesser sentences that could possibly come up. They wanted to be, have, have permission to use those. In other words, if we can't, uh, you know, convict him of the greater crime, you know, the greater accusation, you know, we can't convict him, then we'll maybe be able to get him on a lesser charge. And so they brought all these lesser charges up to the judge. The defense rejected a lot of them agreed on a few of them, said that that was fine, and uh, ultimately Rittenhouse uh, ag- agreed to that. Okay, If you're not keeping up with the trial, you don't know what I'm talking about, it's probably no big deal, but here's what I want to get to. While they were talking about one of the lesser um, charges, they were trying to argue for uh, reckless endangering with the gun. And uh, one thing that came to my mind, because when I was thinking about being quoted out of context, is they said, you know, well, he was being reckless with the gun. And they were like, oh, how do you mean being reckless? I mean, the shots that he fired were at like point blank and he pretty much shot his target except for one of the individuals that I think he was getting kicked in the face. And so he missed a few or something like that. I don't remember exactly. <clears throat> and so the, the, the lawyer said, well, he said on his testimony, he said, you know, I didn't think that the bullets would kill the person that I was shooting. And his defense attorney was like, and even the judge was like, obviously that's not what he meant, right? You have to go back and listen to the context. He wasn't, he was just, they were saying, they were trying to get him to say something to incriminate himself. So they were like, did you, uh, or, or, and you shot to kill Mr. So-and-so. And he said, no, he said, you didn't know that their bullets would kill so-and-so. And he was like, no, I was just trying to get them, you know, to stop pursuing me. I was not trying to kill so-and-so. I was just shooting to stop them. And what he failed to say was, you know, it just so happened that they, that they did die. Of course, I knew that the bullet could kill them, but that wasn't my intent. I didn't want to kill them. I just wanted them to stop attacking me. So anyway, but they took that out of context and they said, you know, they, they just ran with the fact that he said that he didn't intend to kill them. And he's made some comment about bullets or bullets. He doesn't really know what's the difference between one bullet or another. And so they were trying to use that to say reckless endangering, like he's out there just shooting with the gun and he doesn't really care like who it hits or something like that. And I remember thinking like how ridiculous that they would take a word like that, uh, you know, a comment out of that out of context and run with that. Like that's going to be a big portion of their, you know, their, their, their case. But you know, unfortunately in the court of law, Many trials are based on just one sentence that somebody said. It doesn't matter if it's in context, not context. They can say, hey, this is a direct quote from so-and-so, and and they can use that, and they can make it say whatever they want it to say. Now, when we're talking about the Word of God, this is the record, right? This is the record for uh, everything God wants us to know. And when we go out preaching the Bible, it's really, really easy for us to, to just quote God, and oftentimes take them completely out of context. Now, one of the big dangers is when preachers will do that because they want to make a certain point. And even though the Bible's not really making that point, but they want to make that point, so they'll take out of context and then they'll just use that. That's a big problem, but people do it all the time. 
And then a, a kind of a lesser problem there is just, uh, you know, it, it's not necessarily out of context, but, you know, you're just kind of putting it and, and pulling it out of, out, of the, out of the context. You know, it doesn't necessarily, you're not using the context, but you're, again, trying to make your point. And so you're, you're just picking verses. Now, a lot of preaching I do, that's what I do. I, you know, I'll, I'll make a point and then I'll, I'll be thinking about all these different verses in the Bible. And the truth of the matter is sometimes they might not be in perfect context. You know what I mean? But this was a kind of a rule of thumb I have, a policy when I'm preaching. And I'm preaching a, uh, a verse, and, and I use a verse that I'm like, I don't really know if that's what it means. Here's a rule of thumb that I go by. Well, as long as I can prove that point that I'm making through that passage somewhere else in the Bible that I think I, I'm okay using it. Like if it's like, hey, some people disagree, that's what, the, that's what the meaning of that verse is. Like as long as I know that that's a point that's proven other places in the Bible, I'll use it. Otherwise, I'll be like, hey, I don't know if this is what that means or not. You'll hear me say that a lot. I'm not going to say I'm perfect at this. I'm sure I've misquoted uh, the Bible out of context many times, but I'm saying that's what I try to do as a rule of thumb. Now, when we're out soul winning, we use what's called the Romans road. And then there's a few other verses that aren't in Romans, but we'll use these a lot of times. And many times we kind of learn this as just kind of like part of presenting the gospel. We heard somebody else presenting the gospel. I mean, we just preached, I, I just taught five lessons and we went through how we present the gospel. A lot of those verses I gave you, they had no context. I just taught you, hey, this is the verse that we use. And if you're following that along and you're like, hey, we're going to use this whenever we go out soul winning, you might not even know where that verse came from. You just kind of took it out of context and you're just going to use that when you're soul winning. And so what I'm saying is that's not necessarily wrong because you might be using it in a way that, that works. Uh, I'll give you an example of this in a little bit uh, from James. We talked, I preached on James chapter 2 this, this morning. Uh, and I'll give you an example of that, but there's lots of examples uh, that I could use. So, you know, we can use uh, somebody, we can, we can use verses out of context. We can use them to fit our point, you know, even if it's not out of context, just using it to fit our point. We can use them. Here's another important thing. We can use a verse and it's in the right context. It's, it's right. There's nothing wrong with it. But if we knew the context and we knew exactly why that verse was there, what was being said around that, we would be armed and equipped to use it in a much, much better way. So a lot of times we'll quote a verse and we're not super familiar with it. And we really don't know the context. But a lot of times if you just read like the next verse, it would give like a huge, uh, you know, it would be a huge help in your even even in your soul winning presentation or, or whatever. So that's the that's my intent for this um, series is looking at these soul winning verses that we use and looking at, at it in context. Now, since I used 1 John 5.13 in the conference, uh, that was the first verse we looked at. That's where I'm going to start. I don't know that everything else will be exactly in uh, chronological order, but how I would present the gospel. But this is where we're going to start today. <clears throat> so go to 1 John 5.13. You're probably already there. First thing I want to talk about is how this is normally used in our soul winning presentation. Now, for me... Uh, I start with it quite a bit, and the reason why is because oftentimes somebody will say they don't think that anybody can know for sure how to go to heaven. Now, a little bit probably more popular than that are people that say that they, they are going to heaven, and then you try to find out how they know they're going to heaven, and they think that they're getting there because they're good or, or whatever. And so what I brought up in the conference is, what we really want to do is kind of get them from that point of thinking that they're good, thinking that they've done enough good works to get to heaven, or God's going to overlook that, uh, their sins or whatever, and get them to the point where they say, you know what, I really don't know if I'm going to go to heaven. How can anybody know for sure? All right, so then I bring them to 1 John 5, 13, and I will often show, share with them this verse where it says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So I'll let them know. Hey, right there it says you can know for sure you have eternal life. And then it's not through your works, but it's through believing on Jesus Christ. And then you want to show them you know, some more about that. Now, I don't believe that anybody, in fact, please don't, preach the message that I'm about to preach just because you brought up 1 John 5, 13. That wouldn't be helpful, okay? 
you're welcome to quote John, 1 John 5, 13. What we're looking at today is hopefully going to help the soul winner or help whoever uses this verse to kind of understand why it's there and why it's why we why we can use it based on what John's saying in this in this chapter. Okay, so uh, many people will say, "I don't think anybody can know." We want to show them that the Bible says we can know, and so we'll, a lot of times we'll start uh, right here. Now let's give some background. Uh, okay, who's the author? This is John. Now help me out. Who? What other books of the Bible did John write? Anyone? Anyone? John? Revelation, someone said. And John. They, they are not first, second, third John, but the Gospel of John. Okay, John's uh, uh, a Gospel. What's the word I'm looking for? Anyway, Gospel according to John. So we got one book. We got first, second, third John, those three letters, kind of general epistles. And we've got Revelation. That's a lot of, you know, outside of the Apostle Paul, that's a pretty big portion of the New Testament that's written by John the Apostle. And one thing you'll notice when you're reading his words is he's very clear to tell his authors why he's writing, what he's writing. Uh, I mean, not his authors, why he's telling his audience why he's writing what he wrote, you know, uh, or, or why, why he's getting ready to write the thing that he is writing or, or whatever. Now, let me show you this. Okay? First of all, look at John. Uh, this is... Uh, Many times, John, by the way, is one of the books that we'll recommend after somebody gets saved. We'll say, hey, read the, the book of John, the gospel according to John. And uh, and we'll use a lot. In fact, John 3.16, you know, one of the f most popular so evangelistic verses in the Bible. We'll use a lot of these. But if you look at John um, 20... So this is the end of the gospel account. I'm going to use it without context, so we'll have to come back and preach this. <laughs> John 20, look at starting in verse 30. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. That's a lot like what he says in 1 John 5. He's saying, here's why I wrote this book, you know, the gospel of, according to John. Here's why I wrote it. Basically what he's saying is it's a gospel tract. <laughs> right? I want him to write this so that you might believe in Jesus, you might believe that he's the Son of God, and that by believing this, you might have life through his name. Okay. So John right away wants people to, or not right away, but at the end is saying, Hey, here's why I wrote all this. There's a lot of other things I could have wrote about that Jesus did, but these are the ones that I'm keying in on so that you might believe in Jesus. Look at, uh, revelation book of revelation, start in chapter one. This is a little different. The wording is not quite the same, but you see where he's interested in talking about why he's writing what he's writing. One one says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, gave to Jesus, right, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent that and signified it by his angel unto his servant John who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. So he's telling them why he's writing what he's writing. Look at the end of the book, chapter 22. Revelation 22, verse 6. And he said unto me, These things are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly uh, be done. So he's telling everybody why, uh, why he did that. He said, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard, them, uh, heard and seen, when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel that showed me these things. Okay, and then of course, Revelation also says not to add or take away from any of those words. So John is interested in letting people know why he's writing, 
and, and, and what exactly he's writing to. So let's go to 1 John, but we'll start with chap, uh, 1 John 1. First John chapter 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Notice that word is capitalized. Of course, we're talking about the word of God. This is, again, something that is specific to John when he writes this. He write, he's written it in the gospel of John, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's written it now in the epistles of John. He'll write throughout, he'll call him the Word. Uh, like in, in John 5, 1 John 5, 7, where he says, uh, These three bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. I'm, I probably messed that up a little bit. And then in Revelation, he also says the, his name was the Word. Okay, so again, this is specific to John. <clears throat> but he says this... Uh, and four times in his books, he talks about what he's writing, why he's writing, or, or whatever. Okay, so you're in, uh, what did we just, how far did we go down there? Uh, okay, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, and we also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, when he's talking right now, I believe the reason he's saying we so much is because he's giving his authority as an apostle. He's writing this general epistle so that anybody who can read this who's a believer, which would include us, by the way, anybody who can read this can glean these things that he wants them to glean. But he starts off by saying, hey, you know, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, he's saying, look, I was an apostle. He was one of the inner three, Peter, James, John, right? And so he was... Uh, uh, no, that's not the same John. Sorry, I messed up. <laughs> but anyway. He's declaring that you know, he was with that group that saw Jesus and handled Jesus and, uh, and, and all that. Okay, so uh, let me see here. He says, that, uh, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 4. And these things write we unto you. But it may be full. So he starts the book saying, hey, I'm writing all this to you because I want your joy to be full. Actually, he says, we, uh, these things write we unto you that your joy might be full. He's still kind of using all of them. But from this point on, he's going to speak in a more personal level. Okay. Chapter two, chapter two, uh, look at verse one, my little children, these things die unto you. Now, this is why he's writing. Okay. This is why he's about to write, to write what he's saying anyway, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sin, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Okay, now, in verse 1, he established the point that he's writing to his brothers and sisters in Christ, okay, so that we can all have the same fellowship, and he's talking about uh, the open invitation. He calls them in chapter 2, my little children. Right, he's talking about people who are already saved, and he's trying to disciple them. Okay, so it's very important that we understand that whenever we read uh, John's letters here. Again, I'll talk about that, about James, because that comes in, into play as, uh, with James as well. <clears throat> All right, look at verse 13. You're in chapter 2. Look at verse 13. All right, verse 12. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome, overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Now, I have preached at least one message on this particular text right here. I'm not going to get into it today because it's a little bit uh, confusing. But uh, you see here that he's talking to the different people, people groups, the little children, the fathers, the young men, the, primarily talking about how long they've been in the Lord, how long they've been serving the Lord. And he's, uh, and he's talking to them and telling them, hey, this is why I wrote, wrote to you. All right, now uh, at the end of the chapter, verse 26, 
He says, These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. He's like, here, I'm writing to you. This is always a good thing to warn the church that people are going to come in and they're going to try to teach damnable heresies. There's going to be people in the world that are going to try to seduce you to false gospels, false teachings, and what have you. So he's saying, uh, you know, the, these things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. If you back up, he's talking about in verse uh, uh, 22, uh, Let's see, verse 20, verse, verse 21, he says, I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Christ, I mean, that, that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth not the Father and the Son. And I'll, by the way, the Jews are, you know, he was dealing primarily with Jews who rejected Jesus Christ. And so he's going against them and he's saying, like, don't let these people seduce you. Don't let these people try to... Uh, persuade you to believe, you know, it's not through Jesus Christ. It's, it's, you know, he didn't come, but we got to stay under the law or whatever they, they're going to seduce you with. And he's saying, this is why I wrote to you so that people wouldn't, uh, wouldn't seduce you. All right. And then we come to chapter five. We'll just skip to chapter five. And I'm just kind of giving you a little bit of a background of how we got to, uh, you know, where we are in, as far as John's writing this letter, okay? So now he's summarizing, he's kind of coming down to the end, and verse four, verse 13, again, was the, the main text that we're looking at. It says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Okay, so let's break down the context of this verse. The con context meaning, you know, all the verses, all the material that's before and after this verse that we're looking at. Okay, let's break this down so we have an idea of what he's saying. All right, chapter 5, verse 1. He starts by saying this, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. All right, let's stop right there. He starts by making this, he starts this, this chapter right here by making this, uh, making this statement that you are born of God by what? Let's read it again. Whosoever believeth, right? Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So right off the, right off the bat, he's telling them, you know, this is the main issue, okay? If I'm talking to you and you're born again, it's because you believed on Jesus Christ. That's very important because a lot of people want to make this all about works and uh, and your salvation. You know, is, is based on uh, uh, not necessarily how good you are. Most most people, evangelical Christians, would say, no, we don't believe in a works based salvation. But you know, you do have to repent and turn of your sins and all this stuff. And ultimately, what they end up doing is defining a works based salvation. Okay, and so uh, he's saying right here, no. You are born of God because you believe on Jesus and, 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 and you believe on him as the, as the son of God. Now, you know, again, this is, what he's, this is what the story he told in John 3 where Nicodemus is talking to Jesus and Jesus said, you must be born again. Nicodemus, like, how am I born again? I go back to my mother's womb, be born a second time. He says, no, 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 that which is flesh is flesh, that which is spirit is is spirit okay so he's not talking about being born of the flesh we've already done that there's nothing you can do in your flesh you know there's nothing you can do to go back and be reborn turn over a new leaf that's a word that's a phrase some people use right uh now look if in this flesh you've made a lot of mistakes and after you get saved you're like you know what i really need to clean up my life well praise the lord yes you're supposed to do that <laughs> okay yes you're supposed to go back and try to read you know fix some mistakes that you've made in the past or whatever, but that's not your salvation. That's just what you should do because you're saved. But what's saved is not this flesh. What's saved is that spirit. Okay, You're spiritually born of God. It's the spirit part that belongs to him. This body is going to go into the ground. This body is going to be eaten by worms or disintegrate, whatever, however, uh, whatever the process is. Okay. Now, uh, the second part of that verse is this right after uh, he says whoever believes that Jesus is the uh, Christ is born of God 
And everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. Now this is a entire, this is a different issue, right? He's saying if you're born, you're born because you believed in, in God. Now he's saying like, if you believed in God and you're born of God, then you love God. And not only if, and if you love God, then you would naturally love Jesus Christ. Okay. You wouldn't just, you wouldn't say, well, I love the Lord, but I don't believe in Jesus Christ because that's not possible, right? If you either accept all of it or you accept none of it, you can't be like, well, I accept God the Father, but I don't think he had a son or some Muslim doctrine or some Jewish doctrine or something like that. No, no, no. You have to believe in Jesus Christ. Okay. And so he's saying that, uh, um, yeah, you, know, you can't love, let me see here. Uh, we love uh, him that is begotten of, of him, of the Father. And then it says, by this, we know that we, have, that we love the children of God because we love God and keep his commandments. So another thing that you're going to do if you are begotten of God is you're going to love the children of God. How do we know if we love the children of God? And then it says kind of a strange thing here. It's like, well, you'll keep the commandments of God. And it's almost like as long as I'm, I'm following God and I'm walking in his commandments and I'm trying to do, all right, what does God want me to do? What's going to, what's going to please God? And again, we're talking about somebody who's already saved, but somebody who's saved is like, how am I going to please God? Well, here's what you're going to do. You're going to follow the commandments of God. And in doing that at the same time, really, this is the way I understand it, you're going to be loving people. Right? Because what are the commandments of God? You know, all, almost all of them that have to do with our relationship towards man, which is you know, the ones that the, the Bible elaborates on the most. There are some specific commands that, you know, in our relationship to God, but primarily the commands that he gave had to do with how we treat our brothers and, and sisters and our neighbors, right? even our enemies. These are all different things that God told us to do. And so it's like, well, if we love God, we're going to follow his commandments. If we follow his commandments, we're going to be loving people. It kind of all goes together. <laughs> so here's, you know, you're loving, you're, you're loving people by loving the God, by keeping his commandments, all these things. Okay. So he's talking about this. And again, I'm just reminding you that he's talking to Christians uh, and he's saying you were born of God because you believe in Jesus. Say now that you're born of God, he's saying you're going to love Jesus, and you're going to love uh, the brethren. Again, it doesn't mean you're going to love them perfectly, all right? Uh, it's not how much you love God and love the things of God. Uh, that's a different issue than whether or not you're born, you're born of God. Look at James chapter 2. This is what I preached on in, uh, in Iola. Go back a little ways to James chapter 2. Now, this is another passage that a lot of people take out of context. And they say, you know, you're justified by works and not by faith alone. And I just preached a message this morning in, uh, in Iola on that, so I'm not going to, I'm going to try not to rehash the whole thing. But look at verse 14. He says, what doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? And so I showed it here, this was basically the points of my message. I'm not going to preach the whole thing, but I'm going to give you the points real easy. First of all, what he's talking about is the profitability, right? He's talking about, is this profitable or not profitable? And so, I, you know, I pointed out, I promise I'm not going to preach a message, but I pointed out this morning that, you know, you can, you can uh, just, I'll just give you one example. I said, you can have an apple tree that doesn't produce any apples, but it's still an apple tree. Okay. Now he's saying here, what is it profit if you say you're a Christian and you have faith, but you don't do any good works? It's not, it's not, it's not profitable. He's not saying that you're not saved. He's saying not profitable. Okay. So that was the first point. And then he says, uh, he, he, and then here's the other thing. He's talking about what does it, does it profit? So he's talking about profitability. Number two, he says, my brethren, who's he talking to? Save people. And we know the Bible is so consistent following the Gospels. Jesus made it clear. Even the Old Testament makes it clear. Abraham believeth uh, in God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Uh, there's so much that shows that God is not interested in saving us based on how good we are because we all fall short. Our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, Isaiah says. And so 
God is interested in us simply putting our faith in him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so if we put our faith in him, then we're brothers and sisters in Christ. God's our father. Okay. So he says, what doth it profit? My brother. And he's talking to, he's talking to save people. And he says, though a man say he hath faith and have not works. What, what, what is that? What's that profiting anybody? Then he says, can faith save him? So the last point that I made was that the word save here doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily a reference to spiritual salvation or being born again. In fact, a lot of times, probably most of the times the Bible talks about being saved, it's talking to Christians and it's talking about saving your life, like not, you know, from destruction or, or something like that. Okay, so here's what it says. It goes on to give you the context. Again, context is key, right? If a, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food... And one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give, them not the, uh, you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? So he's saying, look, you know, how is that saving a, a person? How is that going to save somebody that you say, Hey, I, I see here that you're starving and you're freezing to death and, uh, and you could use some clothes and you, you know, so, you know, go and be filled and go be warm and all that stuff. What would be the profit if you didn't actually do something for them? You know, and that was, it was all talking about the profitability. So first John isn't much different than that. He's talking to believers and he's talking about now, hey, like if you are born of God, then here are the things that you're going to do. And, uh, he's, he says, uh, whosoever is born of God, look at verse four, whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So that's where we get the song. Faith is the victory. That's what overcomes the world. Now, look, have we, have we overcome the world? How about death? Have we overcome death? Are we still going to die or not? Yes, physically, we're still going to die, right? We haven't overcome that. Have we overcome the temptations and the trials of the world? Are bad things going to happen to us now that we're saved? Yes, they're going to, we didn't overcome those things from happening to us. You know, so we didn't overcome the physical things of this world. It's saying we've overcome the world because in our faith, you know, we've been saved. By putting our faith in Jesus Christ, we've been saved. And so therefore, we've overcome the world. Now this flesh is still going to have to battle with the things of the world. All right, so how does a, uh, verse 5, how does a believer overcome the world? He says, who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Nothing about works. It's all about believing Jesus Christ. Those are the ones that are going to overcome the world. <clears throat> Our flesh will indeed die, but it isn't. It isn't born of God. It's born of the flesh. Okay, Our spirit is not going to die because our spirit is born of God. Now, first, he's going to discuss uh, what it is about Jesus that we're supposed to believe. Now, this is important because we could just say, hey, here's how, you're, here's how you get saved. Believe in Jesus. They say, okay, I do believe in Jesus. Amen. That means you're saved. Not necessarily because what do they know about Jesus? What do they know that he did? What do they know about who he is? Okay, now I'll, I'll say this. There are, you, could, you could lead a, a, a child to the Lord, and he could put you know, that childlike faith in God, in the Bible, in what his parents are teaching him, whatever. And he is going to, by faith, I believe, receive all the things from God's word because he's put his faith in what he knows. Okay, so I do think that you don't have to know uh, all the ins and outs, all the doctrines about Jesus, all the doctrines about, <clears throat> you know, the resurrection and all this kind of stuff. I don't think you need to know that to be saved. That's not what I'm saying. But there are some things that you're going to have to understand. And if they're pointed out to you at some point, like, for instance, the Trinity. The Trinity is a hard thing to understand. We don't go into this, like, 20-minute discourse at the door when we're leading somebody to the Lord and say, well, let me explain to you the Trinity. He's like, Draw out the diagram like I did this morning in the Sunday school. He's God is the Father. God is the Son. God is the Spirit. But God the Father is not God. The... <laughs> you don't have to draw out this diagram and show them what the Trinity is. Like you probably don't have time when you're just leading them to the Lord, right? But you're showing them the basics of uh, the Bible. So he's going to tell you here uh, what it is that they're putting their, their faith in. Look at verse 6. This is he 
All right, who, let me back up again to verse 5. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? And that word, son of, that phrase, Son of God, is really important too. This is he, the Son of God, that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. <clears throat> What does it mean, water and blood? Now, interestingly, let's put, hold your place there and go to John 3. Same author. And let me explain what I mean by same author. That might confuse somebody because you say, well, I thought God is the author of the Bible. Okay, This is God's word. But here's what God did. God used men throughout history through, you know, like 14, 1500 years time frame. And he used various men, at least 40 men. And these were human men. And it's not like they, you know, like I think Joseph Smith and some other people, Muhammad, you know, all these, all these uh, religious leaders claim to like God just kind of wrote, to, you know, spoke through them and they just like picked up a pen and just, and they just didn't have any control. They just started writing things out. That's not how he worked with the prophets in the Bible. All right. He used their own minds. In fact, most of them dictated it to another guy who wrote it down. But he used their thoughts, their styles. You can typically go and figure out, even if you didn't know the name of the book, you could kind of figure out who wrote it by the things that they say. You pretty much figure out what Paul's writings are. I've just showed you a few things about John's writings that, that you know, kind of clarify that this was John that wrote that. And uh, so God used the human beings. He used their own creativity, their own will, their own uh, thoughts and, and, and their life, their upbringing and all that stuff. And he used that. And as they wrote out the things that they saw and the things that they witnessed and the things that God inspired them to, uh, to talk about, they wrote it in their own vernacular. They wrote it in their own language and, and, and expressions, if that makes any sense to you. But God st is still the inspired word of God, you know, and that, and that he, he used these guys and he preserved their words uh, for uh, for us to have. So anyway, now here's John, the same writer that we're talking about in 1 John. John chapter 3 is the story about Nicodemus coming to Jesus at night, like I talked about. And uh, he says in verse 4, how, uh, Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Now, this is, it's very interesting, but all throughout history, you can go back to like the first century, and people were debating over what this water is talking about. What does it mean, born of water? Some people meant water, thought it meant water baptism, and some thought, well, it's the water of the Word. It's the washing and regeneration of the Word. And all these people said all these different things. I think Jesus makes it very clear what He's talking about because He says, look, you've already been born in the womb. You've already been born of the flesh. Now you need to be born of the Spirit. So when you were born in the womb, what were you surrounded by? Water. <laughs> okay, you ever heard a woman say, my water broke? That's what we're talking about. We were in water. Now people say, yeah, but there's nowhere else in the Bible where it talks about that. Well, first of all, that's not necessarily true because I'm showing you right now in 1 John, he's saying the same thing. Jesus, he said he wasn't just born of water, but he's born of water and blood. Now this is the way I understand it. Okay, if someone dis disagrees with me, I'd be happy to, uh, to talk about this. Here's the way I understand it. If it was just this miraculous birth, we know Jesus was born of a virgin. Miraculous birth. He's just inserted somehow into her womb. Because I've heard people say, well, her, the, the womb, Mary's womb was just like a holding place. Okay. So here he is. He, Jesus, he's just in the water, but he's all God. And he's just in Mary, Mary's womb. All right. That would be one thing. And some people do believe that. But the Bible makes it very clear that it was more than, it was more than that. Okay. He also had human blood. And guess whose blood it was? It was the blood of Mary. He even gives the genealogy and everything. And I would suspect, I can't say this for sure, but I would suspect if you saw him, in fact, all of this, all of the neighbors, you know, all of the their friends and family, you know, it's not like they were like, you know, have you noticed that Jesus doesn't look anything like Joseph and Mary? 
right? I think, I mean, I don't think he looked anything like Joseph, but I think that, no, maybe he did because Joseph's line was also it kind of intersected at some point. Anyway, that's another. <laughs> but, Mary, but Mary, I can almost guarantee you, they said, oh, you know, his eyes have eyes like his mother or something along those lines. Now, look, there are people that are offended by that. No, 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 you can't make God man. But guess what? I don't make God man. The Bible makes Jesus man, okay? Jesus is 100% God, but he's also 100% man. When he was in the womb, he was in the water, but it wasn't just water. He was also connected to Mary and received her blood. Now, this is the way I understand this, this passage here. So what we the reason that's important, why we need to believe that, is because he came for one reason. Because he was to pay for the sins of the world. Okay. Now, if it was just, if it was just God, God can't pay for the sins of the world. He's God. He can't just in and of himself. If that was the case, why wouldn't God in heaven just say, you know, hey, I, you know what? I take it away. You're saved. Right. But no, God has to pour his wrath on somebody and he can't pour his wrath on God. So God had to literally become a man so that that man who is actually man, actually human, was all was was the only was also perfect and his blood was holy still had mary's blood in him so you could say like well yeah but there because that's the argument some people make like yeah but the blood was tainted and all this kind of stuff no he was a sinless man he never sinned but he had the dna of mary and the spiritual dna <laughs> and physical dna somehow of the holy spirit right she was with child of the holy ghost bible says and so the reason that's so important is because he was the only acceptable and pure sacrifice that could that could ever you know I can't that no matter how good I am if I cleaned up my life and I'm like spotless the rest of my life as as much as I can per possibly be spotless I couldn't take the I couldn't take away somebody's sins no matter what there's no way I could say God take my place so that they can live he would just laugh and say hey you needed somebody to take your place and that person needs someone to take their place too and the only one that can do that is Jesus. So it's very important that someone believe that understand that whenever they're you say, well, I believe in Jesus. Well, what do you believe about Jesus? You know, I, they they you want them to say, well, I believe he was the Son of God, and he came for one purpose, and that was so that he could fulfill, you know, the the payment that was needed for my sins, and so he came so that he could do that. Right? Let's see whatever what else it says. Verse uh, seven. For these, I'm sorry. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these agree in one. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this is a little confusing, and I'm not... Again, I, I think this is just continuation of what I was just saying. All right. In heaven, you got the, you know, you got the Father, uh, the Word. Let me see here. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, these three are one. <laughs> Again, you have to listen to my message from this morning. They kind of overlap quite a bit. So, uh, so God uh, in heaven, you know, is, is, is a witness to everything that's, that's, that's in this Bible, okay? The Word, Jesus Christ is the Word. He's a witness. He came and he proclaimed that he is the Messiah, all that, everything that's, that's in, this, in this word. And then the other thing is the Holy Ghost bears, uh, he bears witness. And I'll talk about him in a minute. All right, but verse 8 says, And there are three that bear witness in, in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. These three are one. I, I believe this is talking about is the fact, is, is Jesus again. He was born. He was literally born of a virgin. He was born in the womb of a woman, but also, you know, has and he has blood. The blood was shed on the cross, by the way. And uh, some have even made reference to the fact that when they put the spirit inside, blood and water came out. So they said that's the blood and the water is, is witness. Uh, you know, that's a possibility. But I think in context, we're just talking about the water that he was that he was born in, and then uh, and then the Holy Spirit. Let's talk about the Holy Spirit now. Uh, let me see here. Verse. Well, let's just read verse nine. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater for this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his son. He that believeth on the son of God hath the witness in himself. 
He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave his son. And this is the record. This is what we're believing in, right? This is what we're putting our trust in for salvation. God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Sacrifice and atonement that was made for you, you got to receive that. You know, hey, that's how I'm getting to heaven, not by my own works, but by what Jesus did for me, and you're receiving that. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And here's where he focuses. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And it goes on here... Uh, Obviously, the rest of the chapter is great, but let me see here. <clears throat> I want to explain to you here. He says, this witness is in ourself, right? Look at verse uh, 10 again. Uh, yeah, he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. Now, let me talk about the work of the Holy Spirit. When somebody gets saved, the work, the work of the Holy Spirit in a person, okay? Because this, what is this chapter about? This is about, hey, these things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. This is what he's interested in, right? So when somebody says, how do you know for sure that you're saved? Well, you show them the record. You show them, hey, this is what the Bible says. And, uh, and, and then, you know, the, the other missing factor that we can't help is the witness of the Holy Spirit inside them. After they get saved, there's a witness inside them, which is the work of the Holy Spirit. Look at Romans chapter... 8, Romans 8. I'm wrapping it up here. Romans chapter 8. This is a little deeper. This is kind of normally be thought of like a midweek service uh, uh, kind of content, but I think everybody in here can handle this. <clears throat> and so we made reference to the fact that Jesus was God and he was man. He's part of the Trinity. I uh, didn't deal at length in that, but that's kind of implied there with the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost. Uh, we talked about the death, burial, and the resurrection. That was a uh, mention. And, uh, and now we're going to talk about the witness in ourselves. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we, have, uh, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present uh, time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So now he adds in that part about the suffering. Now, not everybody's going to suffer to the same degree for Christ, but here's the idea. Here's what I think in a nutshell he's saying. When you do something for the Lord, it's motivated by your faith. It should be at least. Now, if you do something for the Lord because you want to prove to everybody else that you're saved and you really don't believe in the Lord, but you're just doing it to be sure. Let me give you an example. I've used this many times, but I remember uh, there were some kids in the youth department that started coming to the church and they started wanting to, uh, you know, they were hanging out with, with my kids because we were having a little certain activities or whatever. And this one girl in particular, uh, we had no evidence that she had ever received Jesus. Like she had never put her faith in Jesus, but she's like, you know, trying to change her life. And all of a sudden one day her mom is like, I don't know what it is. All of a sudden my daughter just wants to wear skirts and dresses. And it was because she saw my wife did that and Sharice did that. And she said, now she wants to do that. Now, some people, some independent Baptists that have those convictions, and those standards will be, oh, praise the Lord. She's like turning over a new leaf. She's repentant and she's changing her life. And she's doing all that. No, 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 no. I don't believe she had faith in Jesus yet. She was doing it to impress us. She was doing it because she wanted us to see. And so what happened was whenever there was no you know, nothing really changed. She didn't have that witness within herself. Eventually she was like, well, I'm kind of tired of doing this. All my friends don't dress this way. And so she went right back to dressing how she was before because it, was, it, wasn't, a, it wasn't a decision that she made on her, on her own. Now, when we as Christians do something for the Lord, 
we have this witness within ourselves that said, hey, you know what, that was motivated by the fact that I'm a Christian and I want to do this for the Lord. And I love the Lord, although my love might not always be perfect towards Him, but He is my Father and I'm trying to do something for Him. And it's like the Holy Spirit, the capital S in the Romans 8 verse, bears witness with my spirit. Okay, I'm saved, I'm born again, I am a spiritual being, but I sometimes can't communicate very well with, 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 that, with that spirit. My flesh and my spirit are at enmity, right? But the Holy Spirit communicates with my spirit, and I have this assurance that says, you know, I'm a child of God. Now, I've had people I know are saved, and over time, people confuse them with false doctrine, or maybe they just lived a life of sin, and they started thinking, I don't know, maybe I'm not saved. But as they think about it and they talk about it, they're like, you know what? My salvation is not based on my experience. My, my, my salvation is not based on how good I am or how bad I am or whether I feel saved today and I don't feel saved tomorrow, whatever. My faith is based on the fact that Jesus Christ, I've got the record that he died for me, was buried, rose again, did that for my salvation to pay the price for my sins, and I don't have to live in bondage of, of sin anymore. And when you begin thinking about that, you have this assurance where the Holy Ghost says, Ding, 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 ding. You got it. <laughs> You're a child of God. And so who knows how many people we talk to out there who aren't really born again, but they say, well, yeah, I believe. I believe in Jesus. Okay, I'm going to take, take you at your word. But only you, only through the Holy Spirit can you have that witness within yourself, whether it's true or not. Okay. But John is very interested in letting you know that you can know for sure you're saved and you can know for sure you're going to heaven and that you have eternal life. And you're like, well, how could I know that? Well, do you believe on the name of the Son of God? <laughs> and if you do, you can know for sure. So he's saying, I'm writing this so that you can know. So this is why we use it. And when we're soul winning, if someone says, I just don't think anybody can know for sure they're going to heaven. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you can know for sure. So that's why we use it. And that's a little bit about the context behind it. Um, hope that it made sense. <laughs> if anyone has any questions, you could uh, we could try to talk about it later. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this uh, this lesson. And I do understand, like what I mentioned this morning, uh, both I believe in Sunday school and in our, our lesson in Iola, that our uh, sermon in Iola, that, that some things in the Bible are kind of hard to understand, hard to comprehend, but we believe it by faith and it kind of makes, somehow makes sense to us in the uh, inside. Help us to learn and grow in wisdom and knowledge of your word. And how to apply it to our lives. And most importantly, Lord, help us know that we're saved and help us know how to uh, preach the gospel that others might be saved as well. And I believe if you help us do that, Lord, we see much fruit uh, that we could bear for you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.